Welcome to ESVN, the Emma Sports Vigeland Network show. My name is Emma Vigeland, and my middle name is Sports. <laughs> I'm here to deliver spicy fan takes on a weekly basis. Welcome to the second episode of ESVN, the Emma Sports Viglin Network show. Uh, here to, to recap uh, week one in the NFL. Now, I just want to say thank you so much to, uh, to Ava Raisa, who did the music for, for the show, both the break music and the intro. And it's just like totally awesome. I, I, I couldn't be more happy with it. Um, I was looking for some synths. I just had this this vision in my head with the logo a bit, and, and it completely, I think, complements it really well. So I can't thank Ava enough, uh, and especially because she was so helpful in getting it off the ground really quickly because we kind of scrambled to do it. Um, after I had COVID, I was, like, so behind on preparing for this. But um, it, it really is awesome. So thank you again, Ava. Here again with us is my producer, my buddy, and uh, sometimes speaker on this show, although I call upon him more here than on the Majority Report, Bradley Alsop. What's up, Bradley? I am still recovering from going to MetLife <laughs> Stadium and paying money to do so. No. And uh, I'm still... If you had heard me and my friends, you would have either thought we were extremely mentally ill suicidal homicidal or all three both in the parking lot and um i saw that photo i saw that photo of you in the rain in a poncho just looking like you wanted to oh, die oh make no mistake i didn't even have a poncho on oh so but, i had so, a towel over my head oh that's what that was yeah a rally okay. a jets rally towel to, to to shield me so nothing to protect you from the rain what section were you in in that dungeon that is met life it, in the in the in the uh the, the stadium we share the, as fans. the air conditioner the huge air conditioner that is met life stadium it's like absolutely uh, when brutalist i brutalist architecture when the nfl opened with the bills uh the, the bills rams game and i understand like we could go into, and we should on this show, a whole thing about how taxpayer money is used to fund stadiums for teams that are owned by billionaires who could absolutely raise the money at the very least to fund them. And, um, and don't get me wrong. Like, I had a blast with my friends. Uh, we were we were like absolutely debaucherous. The, the three hours before the game <laughs> were the best part of it. I was like, if we win today, we are burning this place to the ground. Oh, yeah. If, we go, if we're going, if we're 4-0 and going into Lambeau Field, we're flying to Green Bay, then they lost 20 Twenty-four nine dropped the fumble. Craig Zerline missed two, an extra point in a, in a field And it goal. rained on you. And I was, and it was pouring rain, and I, and I was soaked to the bone in my my Ladanian Tomlinson jersey. But I, as much as I had fun and as much as I want to sub- enjoy it, MetLife sucks. It's MetLife terrible. is a MetLife is a bad stadium. It's an <laughs> awful stadium, and not only is it awful in terms of aesthetics and the way it's designed, it's awful in the fact that. I, Look, the Giants are one of the most profitable, despite being terrible for the past decade, profitable franchises in the NFL, and they still use field turf. For people who don't know, field turf increases the injury risk for injuries such as torn ACLs by a significant amount. Um, it's also, by the way, in SoFi Stadium, I believe they use field turf, field turf, and that's where Odell Beckham Jr. tore his ACL for a second time. Um, but, you know, the it, it, in, it is a way to cheap out instead of using rolling grass, which is more expensive, and it increases the likelihood of player injuries. So despite the fact that there are two teams that play there and taxpayer money went to it, it looks like shit. It is uh, not, I think, in terms of the way it's structured around the field, a very nice stadium, and it also is bad for the players. So ridiculous that this... And it's newly constructed. Like... I, I wish, honestly, we're going to start putting more images and stuff, but people should look up. Maybe you could find this, Bradley. I'm yeah. sorry to do this. Look up what the Bears stadium, what the Bears grass looked like over the weekend. It is unbelievably, it's unconscionable that this in, incredibly profitable enterprise in the NFL does not have regulations or it should have, I would say, because that, that that's not true. They do have bylaws about how the the fields need to be uh not structured but 
well, I, don't know, I forgot what the word I'm looking for, but you get what I'm saying. They do have regulations about and bylaws about the fields, but it's not enough. It's not enough because Soldier Field is a total wasteland. <laughs> and um, I mean, it was pouring rain there, but uh, there were also photos of the lines being drawn crookedly in terms of the outside boundaries of the field to go out uh, to to when yeah inside the outside boundaries of the field like it was crooked and and squiggly yeah so like so like beyond the actual like you know the aesthetic failures of the of the stadium too here are uh, a few members of the soldier field staff literally mopping puddles of water off of the field yes standing water on a football field that has to be mopped off no drainage system I mean, it was unbelievable. And then uh, the kicker for the, I forget which team it was, um, the, the, one of the kickers toweled off the field and were penalized yeah. for it. Yes, yeah, the guy, I think the guy, I think the guy who was like, either the snapper or the holder tried to wipe off something with a towel and got an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. <laughs> it, it is just, I mean, dude, th this is not fair. This is a... Uh, billions and billions of dollars go into this enterprise and they are putting players at risk with this uh, lack of field maintenance. <laughs> it, it, it just, it could not be worse. And um, the, the Soldier Field, I think, has a grass stadium. So it's not just the field turf. It's also just poor conditions and poor management of the grass. Um, there, they, the Soldier Field has had problems with this uh, multiple times. There was an Elton John concert that completely destroyed the field before a preseason game, and they still have not fixed anything. Don't even get me get started on, say, the Commander Stadium, which almost, I think, killed a player because the banisters were not screwed in tightly enough. I think it was Jalen Hurts, and people started falling on top of him. Oh, and he was absolutely the most relaxed person I would have ever seen with having literally he's people, so cool people drop drop from above him onto him and he literally just was like high-fiving them and signed something for them i it, would have been like i am filing a lawsuit i am i am taking bruce allen and dan at dan snyder for literally every single cent that they're worth i would that happens to me but jalen hurts is like man it's unfortunate that he plays for the eagles because he is the one of the most likable players in the nfl right now could not be a cooler guy they were they looked they looked good they looked good yeah well let's get into yeah, it get um, into i did it. not anticipate that tangent so um i i, I should also maintenance? say housekeeping <laughs> yes i'm pretty sure we're gonna do this on monday instead of tuesday um because while the monday night game and this monday night game in particular has a lot of storylines coming out of it I don't want the other games to be stale and I want to recap the bulk of the NFL games and leave the Monday night game for say another time because another housekeeping announcement that we have is Bradley and I are going to do our locks on, on Thursday. We're going to do like a 30 minute bonus episode around the same time, 4 PM Eastern on Thursday. And uh, we will save the results of last week's uh picks for then but actually maybe we won't because i want to say that i went three and oh <laughs> and the only one that bradley won was the one against the jets about the ravens minus seven shocker <laughs> so i did go three and oh and i was hoping i had this like this thought in the back of my mind i'm not encouraging gambling but sometimes i dabble with little little bets and i i was like god the seahawks might win this game i just I really think that Pete Carroll is going to be so pissed and so ready to go at Russell Wilson that I I at least see the Seahawks keeping it close. And they were six and a half point dogs in that game. And uh, look, they ended up winning. So let's dive right into that before we get into the Giants game. Because last night, the Seahawks defeated the Broncos, the new look Denver Broncos. And I've been low on the Broncos going into this year because of the division that they play in and the fact that I don't think their roster is at the place that the Chargers roster is at and that the Chiefs roster is at, obviously. I mean, the Chiefs should be the favorites to win the Super Bowl. I understand the Bills are the sexy pick, and I think that that 
is influenced by just like, I don't know, people not wanting to pick the Chiefs again. People don't want to do the same thing over again. And I will, but, s- I will say also, obviously, they did start off the season by walloping the super defending Super Bowl champions. But I think what we have to remember before we get into all of this that I want to I want to emphasize and I think you and I both agree on this is that um week 1 is such a variant experience mm-hmm. in that so much of it when you look back on it and re- reflectively at the end of the season or at the end of the playoffs, you look back and realize it essentially meant nothing. And yes. there's there are things to glean on I think in terms of long term either for either for um projections for players or certain thematic elements of the season but some for more often than not the results don't really matter because I think we'll maybe get into it with the Packers and the Vikings but last year in week one the Packers lost to the Saints 38-3 mm-hmm. and then proceeded to win the next 12 of their 15 games and so, Rodgers looked similarly to he to, yeah he to looked similarly bad bad and, right and and it did not and he had Devontae Adams well that's and, different and <laughs> there, that, that Marquez we can pick up Valdez on. Scandling yeah. <laughs> And Alan Lazard, who was out this game with an injury. Um, so he had no receivers that he'd essentially played with. I mean, his number no, one receiver being a, a fourth round rookie. <laughs> his top three receivers, uh, veteran receivers, were all gone in terms of like the guys that he played with last year. Um, and I know Tunyon was back, but we'll, we'll get to that game in a little bit. But last night, I, I, that I was rooting hard for the Seahawks. And um, that's probably because I hate Russell Wilson. <laughs> Uh, and hate is a strong word. Um, I don't actually hate him, but to me, he's, he is a passive aggressive pro management player in my opinion. And I I might undercut that with some of my commentary in terms of like how he centered himself in terms of how he wanted the team to be structured, uh, in his conversations with Pete Carroll, but I think he has an inflated view of his talents. Contrast that with someone like Aaron Rodgers, who did want more input and say in the guy, in the team's decision. So you can draw comparisons in terms of like they're fairly analogous. People thought that Rodgers was done in Green Bay, but Rodgers had a lot more reason to be upset in terms of the weapons and the talent that the team had accrued. Now the Seahawks have, I think, regressed talent-wise. But they played really hard last night. And I think that that says something. Because from what I've heard, what I've read, Wilson is not necessarily a player's player. Um, I think he's quite invested in his own personal branding. And when he was struggling with Pete Carroll and, and the vision for the team in Seattle and he wanted out, which he wanted out for years according to the reporting. And the Seahawks were trying to get a package for him. But when you win a Super Bowl, the fan base is all over you. They love you. And it's lucrative to keep a star quarterback who has been to two Super Bowls and won one Super Bowl in town. Even though it seems like, to me, Wilson has slowed down significantly. I don't see the same burst. And he, at the same time that I felt like his speed was declining which I think is hard when you're a shorter quarterback behind an offensive line because you have to get out to really see the field accurately. Kyler Murray has that problem, but, you know, I would take Russell Wilson over Kyler Murray for sure. Um, And Russell Wilson has had dominant, dominant years. I get that. But I didn't like how Russell Wilson was so passive aggressive in that he would, uh, it was documented, trash Seahawks management behind the scenes and then go in front of the, the the podium be i'm mr unlimited like <laughs> go hawks and and just be the company guy and it was really fake to me at least when aaron Rodgers had issues with the packers he said it yeah, you knew i mean you knew and so i just don't think he's an honest honest person and it, frankly it's the same issue i have with tom brady and how he handles the media i mean they lie constantly um, yeah, the issues here, I think, like you said, are both mechanical in terms of the athleticism piece and the and, and as well as the because I because I, we were literally saying it last week and I was kind of saying in the sense of like, I do want to look when we get a little bit more data with him on the Broncos, what kind of his either air yards or his scrambling is like relative to kind of his peak years in Seattle, yeah. because even yesterday in some of the in some of the scrambles he had. 
his his awareness and his reflexes still seemed okay in the sense of when when pressure came, he, I think he was able to get a few dump offs that were smart, either to Javante Williams or to Judy or to Melvin Go- or to Jerry Judy or to Melvin Gordon. But he had that his, one great play, the Judy. But, oh yeah, but on, but that could have been easily intercepted. One hundred percent jump ball. His own. He he's lucky that Judy is an is a freak athlete and was able to get that ball also, but. His scrambling looked much, he looked a step slower than he did before, or at least since he, you know, the height of his career. And also, I'm always a believer in terms of reporting like that of, the, you know, ESPN kind of reporting about the rift between Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson. Um, where there's smoke, there's fire. I don't think any of the stuff that gets reported like that is completely baseless. And also, you had, what, eight to ten of his former teammates on Twitter publicly clowning him yeah that's what i'm debut. saying I that just, never like, happened with rogers and i no. know he lied about getting vaccinated i understand they that. still liked him enough his enough teammates to... like him except for greg jennings right and right. and right who, like, who was like riding brett, brett Favre's nuts sorry richard sherman was joking about how in the goal he was struggling with the goal to go scenarios doug baldwin tweeted a gif like everyone was clowning this guy they don't like him he is not well liked in in the locker room for the most part and i take that seriously i mean for me that was part of why i was always defending odell beckham jr was because the only people that didn't like odell beckham jr were giants management and the mannings who were controlling the narrative in the media and Odell Beckham Jr. was loved in the locker room. And I take that, I, I, I really do take that as kind of like, you know, putting my finger to the wind to, to gauge these things. So regardless, I just, I was rooting against um, Russell Wilson because I also thought, speaking of Eli Manning, that Geno Smith has been underrated his entire career. The Jets, sorry, Bradley. I mean, they ruined, they ruined quarterbacks. That's what they do. They and don't they just ha- ruin quarterbacks. They ruin everything. <laughs> yeah. I was saying to my friends on Sunday, I was like, every so often there is a player or not every so often, most of the time there's a player who, when he puts on a Jets uniform, there is a vial of poison in there. And Gino must've been one of those because he put on a Seahawks uniform and he played like, I I mean, I have literally never seen him play football like that. He was out of his mind, fired up. I mean, and rightly so. He's and getting looked his fir- good. Like looked actually like looked genuinely athletic. He's in his thirties. Is smart. he not? Is yeah. he? Is he not? Um, he he must be. He's thirty one, and yeah. he, his athletic burst. Like, well, you I can, couldn't believe it. You can tell he hasn't been hit that often recently yeah. because he still has like better legs than I uh, remembered. Because I kind of remembered him much more as a pocket passer, which part of been. Part of might have been him being underutilized by both the Giants coaching staff because he was Eli Manning's backup and broke Eli's Iron Man streak, which uh, all of these like Giants fans will never forgive him for. I yeah, it's his fault for doing his job. <laughs> I'm of the mind that uh, Eli was should have been benched like not before that, but man, it was really bad towards the end. And Eli did a lot of politicking. Love him forever. <laughs> Brought me two Super Bowl championships. It's amazing. But Eli did a lot of politicking to make it seem like it was the team around him to a degree. Uh, and that has delayed the Giants. I, I, it, it caused them to ha- hold on to false hope that Eli could still get it done for a really long time. And he was much like Big Ben towards the end of his career. Just a real real shell of himself and that's purely vibrational too and what i mean by that is like that was the tishes and the maras being like he won us two super bowls we kind of can't give him the quick hook and in the and in the last few years of his career and it's the same thing with big ben a guy a 14 15 year veteran that stayed with the same team and won pittsburgh a super bowl like they were not going to push these guys out yeah when it probably would have behooved them to because they literally were behind the eight ball with basically we have eli manning and we have eli manning and Geno Smith is our backup. Now what? And then it was, we have Ben Roethlisberger and Mason Rudolph as our backup. Now they're retiring. Now what? So the actual, the quarterback situation most likely could have been at least dealt with or discussed or thought about way earlier. But I just think the cachet and the meaning, they just wouldn't let, like the Giants ownership and the Steelers ownership wouldn't let it happen. Yeah, a hundred percent. It is on, it's, it's the, Eli wants to compete. So I'm not even blaming him. I, I'm just saying that th- these were, these are the politics of the sport. These are the kinds of decisions that were being made higher than who, who is actually delivering for us right now. So with all of that said, um, I mean, I 
was impressed by the way Pete Carroll coached his team up. They play hard. They typically really do with him. Do I think his style is going to win a Super Bowl now in this era? No. But this was a really awesome win for them. And, I mean, Nathaniel Hackett, what the hell was that at the end of the game? I mean, Pete Carroll, he, when he went for it early in the game on fourth and one, he would never, he never did that with Wilson. Very conservative in terms of like his fourth down usage, I would guess, right? That is that accurate in terms of like the next gen stats about, about uh, Pete Carroll's fourth down going for it, ballsiness rate? Because I, my guess is that it's not significant, but he went for it. I mean, they, it, it was personal last night. They wanted to screw, they wanted to screw Wilson over. And I, I, I understand it, and it motivates the team. But Nathaniel Hackett, very perplexing some of these coaching decisions. Um, I really thought that the team struggled to get any catches over the middle of the field. Um, there was, as I mentioned, that bomb to Jerry Judy, uh, and that was a 50-50 ball, and Judy had a really good game and looked even more athletic than I anticipated. Uh, we'll see what the, the season portends for Cortland Sutton, who had a bit of a quiet night. But um, that's going to be the struggle for Russell Wilson as he gets older in his career. Is is he going to be able to not use his athleticism, which is declining a little bit, and stay in the pocket at his shorter stature and see over the line and make big throws? And I'm a little skeptical of that. I'm skeptical of that. And this was not the best look coming off of him getting that massive contract. So, so if I'm a Broncos fan and I'm watching Russell Wilson go into his former home stadium down one with the chance to win the game on fourth and five, and I see them bleed the clock till there's 20 seconds left for when Peyton Manning on the Manning cast is literally almost breaking his fingers, trying to will his former team to take a timeout. And then they ultimately do with about 20 seconds left and bring out their kicker who has never made a, or, or at least in his last four to six attempts has not made a 60 plus yard field goal with the world, with the record for longest field goal being broken last year. And it being four yards more than that. And having that guy, kick a 62-yard field goal. 64. It's, or 64-yard field goal. So two yards uh, uh, lower than the record. Didn't use two timeouts. Uh, didn't, and, you, and you didn't even use the two timeouts. You had to bleed clock properly. And you trot out that guy instead of your $200 million quarterback. I think I'd want the guy fired the next day. Yeah, I mean... I mean, that level of risk aversion with uh, with these circumstances to me is unconscionable. It, it was so cowardly. I mean, the, the guy... Your two hundred fifty million dollar quarterback has to has to be able to get five yards in the must game in a game winning situation, and Russell Wilson should, if he's worth all that money, should be able to make that play. And he was, they, they either Hackett is so incompetent that he did not understand that, which I don't necessarily believe is true, or maybe it's a mix of things, or he didn't feel confident in the way Russ was playing that night. And that's a bigger problem. And another big problem that this this guy always has had. And I and listen, I sympathize, Bronco fans. I'm a Jet fan. There, there's, there's probably not a worse team at fumble recoveries in the last five years than the New York Jets. But I, this is anecdotal. But I don't know if I've ever seen Melvin Gordon not fumble at the goal line. Yeah, I mean, and then Javante fumbled too. And then Javante which Williams, was who is unfortunate, who is who I always thought had sure hands, and also he played when he did not when he wasn't fumbling the ball. He looked he played fantastic. Really well, he was, he was ripping off tackles. nine yards, uh, eleven yards, right? Like but, they they should have they really need to ride the hotter hand there. And there was just so just the two fumble recoveries and the end the end the end of game the end of game planning. I they I think they just squandered a few opportunities by almost looking to make. I think Hackett just got too cute with it and essentially let the moment get the best of him thinking that he was almost like out gaming Carol by not going for it. Yeah. It just seemed kind of like a going two steps too far in terms of your own rationalizing something than just saying, I have Russell Wilson as my quarterback. Why don't I just let him take the chance to win this game? And it was exactly now that you say that this was exactly what Russell Wilson said he wanted with his new team, the ability to cook, right? You you got cooked, bro. You got cooked. And like, if 
this, I mean, this is exactly the situation that he wanted to be in. And so I don't know what, I mean, it's, there was a, I guarantee you Russell was not happy with that call, but if he wants, if he's going to be happy in a situation in Denver, he need they need to trust him to make those plays because he wanted the ability to put the, put the team on his back. That was his whole thing. So, I mean, I, again, Geno Smith looked great. This is the kind of football that the Seahawks want to play. They want to ground and pound. He has a strong arm. He's able to make the right throws in those instances. I thought it was really encouraging and cool to see Will Disley back. They are running a lot of two tight end sets um, there in, in Seattle because they want to run the ball. And, and Rashad Penny looked good, too. So, um, wow, Cortland's on that 72 yards. I, I, it seemed like less than that. But, but yeah, um, I, I think that they should be leaning a little bit harder on Javante Williams. And um, hopefully, look, it, it, Russell could be getting used to this new system. But I thought that that was a pretty discouraging performance. Yeah, and, I, and like I said, again, all of the week one caveats I led with, I think, do apply here. It just was interesting to see. It is always interesting to see the first showing and the first example of a new team attempting to gel what they're what they're trying what they're trotting out what they're trying to do a new coach a first time head coach with with his own staff like it's just I think an interesting dynamic to observe week one of a completely essentially new regime yeah go Hawks <laughs> anyway um. God, that suit that Russell Wilson wore too is like neon green. Looking like the Tin he Man. Tries so hard. He tries so hard to be cool. Um, so let's let's talk about the Giants game then. I'm happy about that. Look, I wore I wore blue uh for the Giants today. I wore Giants blue today. I'm glad one of us is happy. And, and I mean, look, the Giants are in a rebuilding era. I, I Daniel Jones was not good in the game, in my opinion. Um. But Saquon Barkley put the damn team on his back, back. I mean, and I have compl complicated feelings about Saquon, too. Do I want him to get another contract with the New York Giants? No, I think, right? No. But when you see that kind of performance, and I don't think Shane is going to give it to him because he didn't draft him. Because he isn't a moron who drafted a running back second overall when, you know, there was Josh Allen available, who, by the way, at the time, I wanted them to take. Um, just putting that out there. Lamar Jackson went later in that draft. Um, Bradley Chubb, I think, also was in that draft. Lots of really solid players that the Giants could have used who wasn't at a position that was so um, injury-prone. And also, the Giants needed to rebuild at that point, and Gettleman did not understand that this roster needed to be built from the inside out and not taking a skill position player at the top of the draft. He also took McCaffrey. That's not working out well for the Panthers, and it's not working out well for the Giants. However, I mean the talent is unbelievable. When he's healthy, he looks like he looks like one of the fastest, strongest players in the whole league. And he's crafty when he runs. But I agree with you in the sense of like there is no even when he, Saquon was drafted, there was no team-building logic in terms of value no. in the NFL. To draft just, a, to he draft just a fell in love back. with the guy. Exactly. You, you, the you guy. love the guy. You like, you like how he gets off the bus. You like how he, how he holds his fork. Yeah. He's classy. He's, yeah. he's he, got... Team guy. Team guy. Real team, build, real team guy. He's got a good head on his shoulders. But that's not enough to warrant a second overall pick. And the issues that come with that is, like you said... Health and also that the Saquon being out and Saquon not being consistent magnifies the selection. Yes, because it magnifies the other deficiencies as a result of drafting him and paying him that much. Because so, if he is out, you this is it's all about like it, where you allocate your cap. You allocate your cap for the most part to the quarterback position and to the defensive end position, which are you know, and to the the offensive tackle position, which you know they they really do make your team those are team cornerstones and a position like i don't know there's i would say probably three of the more expendable positions and this is not fair because the salary cap i mean the the nflpa should be protecting the 
these players even more, in my opinion, particularly running backs when they get used like crazy coming out of uh, college. But running backs are very expendable. I think the safety position has been a bit devalued when, you know, you're trying to play more man-to-man, right? People uh, I, like Jamal Adams, what did that contract do for the Seahawks? Uh, and li- in the linebacker position, you can have some linebacking stars. Like, you know, I was amazing to watch uh, Devin White on, on, on Sunday Night Football. And then on the other side, you have Michael Parsons who can play both. But, like, no, the, the, the Giants should not have drafted Saquon Barkley. And the other <laughs> thing, too, when you to your point about that, I was thinking almost the same thing, which is that, Running backs, especially now, especially in probably the, the the NFL as it is for the last like six seven years, you look at a bunch of different guys and see how fungible that asset is. Because take the Jaguars for example, they they drafted Travis Etienne early. Etienne got injured, and they had an a thousand yard rusher on their team in James mm-hmm. Robinson who was undrafted. You didn't. You did not. You you did not. The and Jaguars that was did, one of the picks that they got for Jalen Ramsey right. from the Rams. It's like they use they use draft capital that they got in a trade to essentially get like a, get kind of like a gaudy pick that wasn't exact. First of all, wasn't probably going to move the needle super significantly for them anyways. And he was out for the season before week one. So it it also just by virtue of that bad luck too. Like I said, it underscores the badness of the pick when that guy gets hurt. And especially when you have a guy on the roster who was undrafted and went for a thousand yards yeah. already. And, and look, and, and ATN is he's a freaky talent and but and and just to return to the Giants, because we could have a whole conversation about the that as well. But man, you you understand in a vacuum why someone like Gettleman, an idiot, would fall in love with the athlete. Because the athlete is one of the most special athletes in the NFL when half healthy. He is, and he does everything right. He's he, he's in the locker room. But, um, man, I, 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 he really put the team on his back. And he didn't do the Le'Veon Bell thing that was, I'm sorry to bring that up, Bradley, but, like, so difficult to watch at the end of his career, which was, dance behind the line, dancing behind the line. And Saquon did that a lot last year because he was not trusting that knee. Uh, And he got uh, criticized for it because this is what happens when you're the second overall pick and you're not necessarily performing, even if it's not his fault based on the nature of the position. But um, he's back. And he was just all over the place, trucking guys, putting his head down, taking hits he got face masked on that two-point conversion and was hit twice before he get, got into the end zone and that's what won the game for the Giants um some other notes on the game like I'm not sure what's going on with Kadarius Tony but he's another freaky athlete that you see out there it seems like one there are some issues that have gone between coaching staffs as well like it's not just Joe Judge being a stupid New England hard ass Dayball and co seem to also feel like, okay, this isn't, there's something there in terms of, I I don't know what it is, but there's something there. But also it could be too that Dayball, Dayball, big balls, Dayball. (laughs) And we'll get to that, that two point conversion, as I mentioned, like he, he seems to like to bring guys, young guys along slowly. Gabe Davis is a good example of somebody who, did not have a high snap count last year uh, until later in the season. And then, of course, he had that insane uh, four-game, uh, four-touchdown performance in the AFC uh, divisional game. But, it, you know, maybe that's what he's doing with Kadarius Tony. but I do think that the, there should be concerns based on this spanning two coaching staffs. But, man, what I loved seeing was how Dayball and Kafka, the offensive coordinator – really had a good feel for when the offense was getting into rhythm. They would, the first half was abysmal, but they were trying to get small plays, get small plays, get small plays, and then try for the explosive play. And explosive plays, I know that this is trite, um, but that's exactly what wins in 2022 in the NFL. And it seems like they have a good understanding of that, which is, the biggest sigh of relief that any Giants fan can have given uh, what 
the offense has looked like for the past decade, let alone how awful it was under Jason Garrett, who did not understand the concept of an explosive play last year. And if you're not, if you're not an amazing team, if you're, if you, uh, but in terms of talent, in terms of scheme, whatever the case may be, there's a nothing to lose in taking risks, and there's and b everything to gain because you teach the young guys I believe in you that 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 he that he showed in week 1 something that I don't think Joe Judge literally showed them one time in in, in his entire tenure as head coach that he believed that they could get this that, that he could get this to, that they could get this two point conversion and also hang with a relatively good team I know the Titans are not nearly as good as they were last year but they are still have en- they still have enough players to be a formidable opponent for the Giants and for them to stay in the game and remain kind of a pest and to be annoying enough to not only get the win by a point but also stay with them and stay competitive throughout when when certainly a team could go into this game thinking they're going to be a walkover especially with with the Titans at home that's what you want to see in a team that's that's trying to rebuild and trying to get better that they that they are fearless, they are ambitious and they're competitive. Yeah. Even if even if they were to lose that game, even if that field goal were to go in, I still would have thought I that I would have chalked it up to be probably one of the most exciting and best Giants games I've seen in 3 years. Because they because the last they time I felt this way about comp- uh, so a Giants game was week three against the Buccaneers before Brady went there, Daniel Jones's rookie year, where he came back and won the game for them, and they also lost on a missed field goal at the end. But for me, that was a uh, it was a feeling of hope, and I don't believe Daniel Jones will be the quarterback next year, but nor do I think he should be given some of the talent that's going to be coming out in this draft and like, woo, baby, does Will Levis look good? And uh, reuniting with him with Wondell Robinson could be something really fun. But, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I, I, for me, this just like, this was just an exciting indication that this offensive coaching staff wants to be serious in this league and isn't going to be scared out of their damn minds all the time like these previous regimes are and the Giants next three games are all at home in the dungeon that is MetLife and they're against the Carolina Panthers the Dallas Cowboys without Dak Prescott and the Bears so like am I emotionally invested again I don't know I mean I always am but actually imagining they could win on a week-to-week basis well, you got a mediocre, you got a basically mediocre team and a kind of uninspired. No, that's a team bad. They're the they're Pan- not talented. In the, in the Panthers. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Go on. In the yeah. Panthers, um, and Matt Rule sucks. Yeah, as a like, head coach. like a like a just a just a kind of like bad vibes organization all around. <laughs> yeah, the Bears looked like friskier than I expected, but it was also in like biblical weather, a biblical weather situation, and like I'm not certain that'll remain. So I think that we're at, at, the, at minimum will be a close game. And then, sorry, who was the other one we the said? The Cowboys without Dak. And the Cowboys looked like garbage with uh, Dak. Let's do. Let's they, talk about yeah. the Cowboys. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off. I was wrong about that bet. I couldn't have been more wrong. The 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 Cowboys. <laughs> they looked, looked bad with shitty Dak. right away from the from the second the from game the, started. Man, Mike McCarthy is a burglar. He makes money, just, millions of dollars he's every a, year just by existing. He's professionally bad at his job. And it's like just, that's his job, being it, bad at it. It's just a reminder, again, I know that Aaron Rodgers has made many mistakes and his opinions about COVID are so dumb and wrong. But Mike McCarthy is the reason why these idiots on sports radio can say, and, and also, frankly, it seems like it was bigger than him too, the Green Bay organizational structure of only we only draft and we only develop and we never get anybody interesting in the in, in terms of free agency and we won't take a receiver or skill position player in the first round just like yeah. dumb it's worked dumb, out really well outdated <laughs> organizational philosophy but mike marley was a huge reason that aaron Rodgers, who is the most physically talented quarterback that we've ever seen since until now maybe this new era of of mahomes allen and uh um and even Herbert, who perhaps we'll get into, uh, the, 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 one of the greatest ever, 
And for my money, he if he had the right organization around him, he was would be the greatest of all time. Mike McCarthy ruined that. And he's the reason that everybody can say, like, loser Aaron Rodgers choker. I mean, that is his legacy. And he's, I think, this Dak injury, who, by the way, Dak was not playing well before, looked bad before. CeeDee Lamb does not seem to be ready to be the one wide receiver on their team that can make a play. That's not necessarily his fault because everybody's just going to double him and he's not this physically imposing guy that's going to be able to, I don't know, like be like Jamar Chase and fight over double teams. But, um, but, but, but he's, they do not have many playmakers and Ezekiel Elliott looks like shit. And there's no release valve. Michael Gallup is injured. So there's not even a secondary, there's not even a secondary target. You can only get so much offensively out of Dalton Schultz. Otherwise, I'm not even saying I, 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 I this is coming from I someone like who Schultz. likes him Fine. as a player, yeah. but he is not going to be ripping off 70 yard gains for you. He's not going to be putting up 100 plus yards each game like that. That that passing offense is at at cur- currently as it stands going into week two. Cooper Rush throwing to CeeDee Lamb and Tyler and the offensive line. Tyler Bad. Smith is out. So Tyler Smith is is filling in at left tackle. He's a rookie. He got drafted in in April or May whenever the draft was. And Connor he was Williams seen as a project. Yes, he was he's a, a incredible in, incredibly raw but ta- a talented athlete who they who they ideally wanted I think to start inside so he could work out to left tackle with Smith still there. Mm-hmm. Ty, so Smith Tyron Smith is out. So Tyler Smith has to come in. Connor Williams got injured as well. So they're now down a left guard as well. So we're going to have next week for the Dallas Cowboys their backup Cooper Rush with two of the two of their linemen injured, no Michael Gallup, and just CeeDee Lamb and Zeke basically as the skill position players. Like it's kind of a nightmare. Against a hungry and pissed Cincinnati Bengals team. We're not making our picks yet, but that's going to be up there for me. Yeah, that's um, not. I, I actually didn't even realize they were playing the Bengals. Yeah, if, if anything, if if Burrow's going to come off pissed off after a five turnover game. They, there probably couldn't be a better matchup than the Cooper Rush led Cowboys going into week two. So anyway, it is just, it jumped off the screen how bad they looked. The only bright spot for them was Michael Parsons, who continues to be a force. Um, and somebody I wanted the Giants to draft and they ended up, they traded down and uh, that was, that was the first round pick that they got, which was you know good, good, good trade. Wait, no, was that, he, that, that wasn't the right draft. Damn. Hold on. I, think I might he, be think wrong about that. He had two that. sacks, right, Parsons, or something like that. He 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 was he was definitely eating when he was on the line. The only the only uh the only laps he had is when Leonard Fournette really just like knocked him. Kind of, I'm not sure if he actually even saw it coming, but that was basically the only the only misstep Parsons had. But yeah, I, I agree. It was no, just, I was right about that. By the yeah, way, you, yeah. Anyway, so um, but but yeah, right, exactly. So uh, so uh, the Cowboys looked terrible right away, but the Bucks defensively looked pretty good yeah I, I think the offense might be a work in progress Brady they were rolling him out a lot and his foot speed looks a little slow he's afraid to stand in the pocket and get pummeled but Randy Gregory's gone and I don't know if the Cowboys even had the firepower to do that the red zone offense was a bit of a concern but I, I just I have faith in the Bucks, and I have faith in Todd Bowles working with the defense to make them even more stout. They looked really, really good. And those two linebackers that they have there are ballers. I loved Devin White coming out of college. Yeah, he's, he's still fantastic. amazing. He's great. So the Bucks are going to be players in a really weak NFC. And but the story of the game to me is how terrible the Cowboys absolutely. looked off the jump. And for the and for the Bucks and for the Bucks like into, speaking of of line of line needing line help, I mean it, it is not ideal that Ryan Jensen, their their center, is most likely going to be out for most of the season because he certainly had a really really fantastic connection with Brady throughout the years that he's been with the Bucks, and he's also just like a famous famous like like demon on the field. Like mm-hmm. he's just like absolutely one of the nastiest guys on the field when he plays. So missing that tenacity and missing his play i'm sure is 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 something to keep an eye on and it looks like donovan donovan smith one of their other linemen may have sustained an injury as well so that's obviously something to keep an eye on but i like you said i just think the organization is sound enough that like they can kind of 
filter in replacements without it being an enormous liability. I could be wrong, but I think that's something that really separates certain teams from certain teams yeah. is when fill-ins or when replacements or substitutes don't completely derail what you're trying to do on the field. And and, and frankly, the Bucks and the uh and the the Rams who are two of the teams that have won the Super Bowl in the last 3 years, they both have this philosophy that is we're going to get big name guys and we're bringing them in. And to bring it back to Mike McCarthy and what what's going on with the Packers, like there there that that has to be I think a part of the calculation. It makes it easier when you have Brady there. I understand that. But that that's on the organization to sell that to guys. Um and just drafting and developing is not going to do it. You have to supplement with free agency. This isn't 1965. So let's talk about the the Bears then, since that came up a little bit earlier. I mean, insane conditions in this game. As I said, embarrassing that a professional football team has its stadium in this condition. (laughs) And it's not just that it was bad weather. It was the way that the grass was unable to filter it. And the fact that, like... Either the lines were moving on the field or they were not painted down in a way that would be water resistant or they drew them wrong. And, and we made this point earlier, but this goes to show like this just goes to show the issue that we have with with the public footing the bill for these stadiums mm-hmm. is that is that the taxpayer dollar goes to make that stadium and the owners not not only not having that financial burden, knowing the money through TV deals, through revenue sharing, and through ticket sales, concessions, what have you, that essentially no matter what happens, they're going to turn, turn a profit. They don't even feel a reason to actually upgrade anything. You can, so, you can have horrible owners that want, are notorious cheapskates uh, skates like... My, my, Dan- like uh, the Ryans in, in, in Cincinnati. Yes, and, the, the Dan Snyder Dan almost freaking hur- injured Jalen Hurts because it was not... Uh, the the railing was not on ac- uh, uh, sufficiently and it almost fell on him. Like this is always... This is always like, like for example, I was at MetLife um, on Sunday and... We got lost going to our seats because we had to go up, upstairs, up. The, we had to go up an escalator to go down an escalator to get to our seats, and there was not a single functioning soap dispenser in one of the bathrooms that I went to. These seem like minor things, but sometimes structural things mirror what's on the field. And when you see how much money is going into the NFL via these TV deals and how gambling is going to explode, it's it's it is. There's no excuse for it. Yeah. There's absolutely no excuse. And there's also no excuse to raise the salary cap significantly so that players can actually get paid and raise the rookie cap, raise the undrafted free agency cap. I don't want the league to just be like, hey, this we'll raise the salary cap and then quarterback contracts explode for the top 10 guys in the league. No, the lower class of the league needs to get paid more too. And 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 fortunately, this hasn't exactly happened. We can definitely, we can get, I apologize for this tangent again. No, we can, we can get to uh, the... Uh, bears after this but this is something that you see almost to its nth degree in baseball where not only are the is the infrastructure essentially rotted from within because none of these owners really want have any interest in improving improving their infrastructure for their teams as well because they're it's the same thing they're turning a profit no matter what they're not even competing to make their teams good yeah, they're not even paying. They're not even. They're letting players basically beg for for peanuts to to play because they won't sign them otherwise, or they manipulate their service time so they stay in the minor leagues until they are literally able to pay them the least amount of money possible. So like, fortunately, the NFL isn't there yet, but it's like that's that's what it leads to. It leads to essentially a hollowed out like capitalist shell slush fund or shell fund for rich people masquerading as a sports league (laughs) because players can come in and out and because they essentially have a monopoly on their services if you want to play professional baseball you you want you gotta go somewhere you want to play professional football you gotta go somewhere it leads to exploitative practices and that's why sunlight on this is 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 really important a good aside though it was a good aside um because so the bears defeated the 49ers um and it's hard to glean much from this game, given the insane conditions. And as I said, embarrassing that a professional football league allows for this kind of field mismanagement. And that extends to many other teams as well. But 
Justin Fields, as I said, I, I like him. I really do. And I hope that the Bears, despite I, on paper them having the least talented off or least talented team in the NFL, besides maybe the Falcons, in my opinion. And actually I think they're they're less talented than the Falcons without without the quarterback. Um I hope that it seems like they the 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 coaching is not bad right now. And it, it maybe the, it's just like this sense of relief coming out from under Matt Nagy, who's one of my uh, most hated of the past five years. But they, they looked good. They looked good in terms of like their toughness. Maybe not talent jumping off the screen, but I like Justin Fields, and he seems to improve with every game. And this is a game for a bad team that could have easily folded, but they they won a rock fight. Like they won like a they won like an ugly game. Winning ugly is winning ugly is almost harder than having like a perfect scheme and offense like and and defense execute almost like with no hitches because that's also kind of emblematic of like a a a like the scheme being correct as well and everyone yeah. kind of following that to a T. Um, I mean, in terms of you see that, of course, we even saw that with the Chiefs against the Cardinals. This, this, this is just everything and everyone firing on all cylinders. This is a team that does not have like n- even nearly as much talent as the Chiefs and still won a very ugly, difficult game under the conditions. And against a 49ers team that a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people in the in the football world were like genuinely and still I would say are genuinely excited excited for. Well, how did you that feel, brings how did you feel me, about Trey Lance? That brings me to the 49ers. <laughs> I, I mean, well, again, and I want to be kind here because if I'm going to give the same grace to Justin Fields, or, well, I'm praising Justin Fields, but if I'm giving the same grace to the Bears players, it was really hard for anybody to play, especially it got really gross at the end. Um, but I was right uh, last week when I talked about Trey Lance's difficulty throwing short and intermediate passes he is an athlete he's a decent athlete trey lance do i think he's a great athlete at the quarterback position i think that there's something about having some situational awareness eyes in the back of your head that he lacks he doesn't seem to have His brain doesn't seem to translate to the way that he's playing in the way that it's like instinctual for other guys. In fact, it seems difficult and he locks onto receivers and you can see it happening from home. And sometimes that's hard to do because a guy can like look off, but he doesn't seem to fundamentally know how to do that yet either. And If I were on the 49ers team and I knew how damn good we are at every other position, pretty much, the offensive line's kind of not as good as it used to be, maybe. But you got Debo and you got Ayuk and Kittle didn't play, but you'll eventually get Kittle back. You have Bosa on the other side. You, You have one of the best minds in the game as your head coach. I'd be really, really concerned about the way that continuing to start Trey Lance is going to look in the locker room. And they might win next week, right? Seahawks, they're playing the Seahawks next week. The C- they're playing them at home. And they so, won't have the same conditions, and, certainly. And, right. You know? And the Seahawks are going to be, I think they've emotionally exhausted themselves. <laughs> they're coming off a short week, and they gave everything that they could to to that game. But I don't know. I I'm, I'm feel sad for 49ers fans because – I'm looking at this from an objective perspective and as somebody who roots for Kyle Shanahan a lot because I like I really like the way he coaches this looks like a disaster to me and and I think the issue too is that no matter what we were talking about this last week it's hard not to look at Jimmy re-signing with them after all of the scuttlebutt about him leaving to not think that there was a reason behind that and a motivated reason behind that beyond just there not being any takers and I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you'd be an idiot not to. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Or you're just a fan and you're trying to hope, like, hope, the, uh, hope Trey Lance into being good. Yeah, it just to me, it's like if you if you have this guy that was that that, you know, by all accounts, regardless of his play. Is seemingly universally beloved in the locker room, has has been on the field for a number of really significant wins for this team in the past and was seemingly 
one of the hottest like trade commodities in terms of quarterbacks for like more middling teams. And for him to just stay and be the backup for your like supposedly hot, your hotter young quarterback that hasn't really proved himself yet. You wonder a what's the long-term plan here and B regardless of what Jimmy might feel that probably doesn't still a whole lot of confidence in Lance that he's the guy. Of course not. Of course not. And I think Jimmy, from what I've read and what I've heard, like listening to talk radio or reporting on this and people I trust, Jimmy Garoppolo seems to be very well liked (laughs) and BFFs with Kittle and a bunch of other people. And I I just, I think it's only a matter of time before he he starts because to, to lose to a, despite the conditions, to lose to an objectively inferior roster, like by many, many orders of magnitude, in week one, if they lose against the Seahawks, he's getting benched the next game. I guarantee it. I mean, maybe I don't guarantee it, but I feel quite strongly about it because the 49ers should be making the playoffs this year, and you can't have a quarterback holding you back like that. Shanahan is always going to make guys look better than they are. He made Jimmy Garoppolo look better than he is for quite a while, and Jimmy Garoppolo is not in the top two... Not in the top... He's probably... In terms of starting quarterbacks, like what, 22nd in the league, 24th? Would Shan- you take, I mean. Shanahan made Nick Mullins look like mm-hmm. a dynamic rushing and passing a quarterback. And there were a few weeks when <laughs> he made, uh, when he was working on the Browns, like he made Johnny Manziel look serviceable. Right. He, ha- he was responsible for that amazing RG3 season. Right, right. I, I mean, he took the Falcons to the Super Bowl and you. You guys like, or, or, and people are going to be like, oh, you know, he lost it for them too. Give me a break. He got them up 28 to three. He got them up 28 to three. It's the defense that's got to stop Brady and them, but it was Brady and them. And also, and also, he wasn't the head coach. Am I not? No, he was not the head coach. It was it Mike was, Smith. Yeah. Mike Smith was the head no, coach. No, 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 no. It, it was, wasn't Mike Smith? Um, it was Dan, Dan Quinn. Quinn? It was Dan Quinn. Yes. It was Dan Quinn. So, defensive head coach, by the way. <laughs> so, give me a break. Um, but, but I'm, I, I would say I'm, I'm quite concerned about the uh, Trey Lance as the future quarterback. Um, and I think this is going to age quite well because like, I, I, I just, I had, I had, I, I just have a feeling, I have a feeling this is not going to end well. And, uh, I'm sure all the 49ers fans in the comments are going to be upset about this. But I got no dog in this fight. I'm just calling it like it is. And I remember talking to him, I was blue in the face about how terrible Blake Bortles was. And seeing, like, Jags fans re- replying to me on Twitter, like, look at the win-loss record. Like, blah, blah, blah. And look at where we are now. And the same's probably going to happen for Tua, even though, let's bring that to the Dolphins game, because the, the Dolphins game started off with uh, a pass that was tipped from Tua that went a little viral and it looked like he threw it 20 yards short of Tyreek Hill I think um but that wasn't the case it was just people kind of ragging on him however the reason that people do that is because of the limitations of his game however man is Mike McDaniel gonna milk every strength that Tua has out of that guy because that was so fun that was so fun and this is why i like the shanahan group of coaches because they understand how to get the most out of their players even if they're not the best um and like i mean mcveigh another guy from that from that tree did it with mm. jared goff and then he got a good quarterback and he won the super bowl it, it it's it, it gives me no solace because this is a division rival for me but the Again, I haven't when when Gase was the coach of the Dolphins and Flores. Don't get me wrong; I like I think Flores is a genuinely good coach and a great defensive coach. He put up a few games last year oh, man. where that defense looked lights out. Um, but I haven't seen kind of both sides of the ball galvanized like this for a, both Tua leading the Dolphins and also for the Dolphins in general for the last few years. And like like we've been saying, week one caveats aside. This this pairing so far of of you know McDaniel running the offense, um, Tua Waddle and Tyreek like it, it it regardless of what what 
the long-term future holds for them, it, it was at the very least exciting and dynamic to behold. It's perfect for him. It's perfect for what for Tua because he can't stretch the field, but what he can do is he can throw over the middle and he does have accuracy when he's in short and intermediate uh doing playing short and intermediate throws something that like say Trey Lance does not have right now um which is a really good skill set for this offense and so um yeah I, I I'm I'm encouraged and excited by the Dolphins I'm rooting for them I'm I'm really really rooting for them um because I like Waddle I like the the team of Waddle and Tyree Kill because this was where Tua thrived in in, in Alabama, where he was able to have those receivers with Yak. I mean, it was Judy, it was Ruggs, and Devonta Smith, which, but I guess I would include kind of the, the, the more analogous usage would be Judy and, and Ruggs in this instance. But the defense looks really good. You forget that Melvin Ingram is on the Dolphins, which is so exciting, and they're just well rounded. Um, and. Th- it's going to be really hard to stop Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill, two of the fastest players at the receiver position in the league. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Um, so I find the Dolphins really, really interesting. Do I, I, do I have my concerns about how this game is going to translate in cold weather or in bad conditions? Yes, I do. But for now, enjoy the ride, guys, because even if Tua isn't the guy, this roster is arguably top five in football on the whole and also takes solace in the fact that again week one aside the patriots looked like shit oh man they looked bad they looked really awful actually like they couldn't really get anything going on either end of the ball like it just was not they looked they looked kind of like anemic honestly and i'm not usually even with some of the most untalented rosters belichick has had they don't usually look that kind of like lifeless coming out the the offense the, what is going on who is calling plays is it joe judge is, is it matt patricia is it belichick is it someone who has been an offensive coordinator before <laughs> cuz none of those three people have and i know belichick works with um every side of the ball i understand that but this is not encouraging they looked really bad and i understand that the patriots always take a while to warm up it's usually around week four where they they start to to really hit their stride and even in their strongest years and say they leave the first four weeks three and one it doesn't look like it does later in the year and i know that's the same for every team but some teams fall apart the patriots get stronger as they're able to implement their concepts but what concepts do they have on the offensive side of the ball i'm concerned about that I think this is one of the least talented teams they've ever had. And on top of it, the coaching, the, the loss of, of, of Josh McDaniels seems to be really acute right now. Um, and so, look, sorry, Pats fans. Guess you're just like the rest of us at this point. In the basement with me. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. See if you finish with a better record than the Jets this year, bitch. They definitely are going to. They will, but um, but 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 man, I mean, it is really an interesting sight, and um, uh, I, it it is a bad uh, it's a not a great indication for like or piece of evidence for my it was more Belichick than Brady takes uh during those time that time, so that's part of why it stings a little bit because I I I'm partly rooting for Belichick for that reason. Like I wanted Belichick to get a ring without Brady, but probably not going to happen because <laughs> if I were him, I'd retire um, given the state of the roster and his, I, I, it's hard to question him. Right. But there have been some questionable moves. There've been some really questionable moves and I, I, his sons on the defensive yeah. staff. We have no idea what his role is. I don't like that nepotism element, even though I just praise Kyle Shanahan. So I'm contradicting myself, but Shanahan's proved that he can be a great coach. And I'm not sure about mini Belichick, but I think looking for the past like 10 years or eight years of the Pats, like draft picks from the first to the fifth round, let's say, um, I don't think there's any more proof that you need to, to establish that, 
Belichick should maybe stop making the personnel decisions as well as be coaching the team. He has not drafted well in a long time. Like they're like if you look at a list of those players, the majority of them either were complete washouts, were traded very early on, or don't play with the team anymore at all. And I, there are some good players that he did that he did draft, like that safety uh, Kyle Duggar, and um, also the that you know who I uh, that 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 player Christian Barmore, um, who they took in the second round uh, defensive tackle. But other than that, I don't know how many draft picks they've necessarily hit on yeah, and like, recently. And like De- Devin McCourty is obviously good, but McCourty's old. He's he's been in the league a really long time. And they lost J C Jackson. J C Jackson's on the Chargers now. Um, I like Devon Godcho. He's one of their one of the guys on their front seven, but he's kind of a he's a minor piece. Like it's 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 kind of like picking a skeleton trying to find like real impact players besides like like who you mentioned and even maybe Mac. But Mac's in his second year. It remains to be seen what he will be long term. And also he didn't even he doesn't have the athletic upside of a lot of these guys. He's he's a, he's a, an accurate passer but he's not very super mobile like it's it's not super easy to see exactly what this team is trying to be yeah and fierce deity writes and i mean we know who's calling plays it's patricia he's not qualified and he's not going to do a good job but for the time being that's who's doing it i don't know if that's true i mean that's what they say but they they lie all the time and some of the obfuscation around it makes it makes me think that maybe belichick is calling plays and his son or something is handling the defense and i have no idea i'm just speculating because no one has any idea because belichick has accumulated this like persona and ability to just shrug off the reporters in in boston and um i don't know how long he's going to be able to do that if this is this continues to be the performance Guys, we're going to be taking calls in probably around 20 minutes. Um, so just a heads up, you can call in 646-257-3920. Uh, so what, and you can also uh, write in with your IMs. I will get to them in a little bit. Maybe I'll read some right now. Uh, Emma's absent microphone says, this music rocks. I know, right? Um, Emma's absent microphone says Russ arrived in a stupid shiny suit, put on a stupid orange and white suit, left with an understanding of what it's like to be in the wrong team in the Hawks game. Hashtag, yeah, okay, you can go ride. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You guys, that's, that's, that video of him too practicing high fiving is yeah. kind of just the encapsulation of the Russell Wilson experience. Trying so hard to be human. <laughs> it's just imp- this is what I do, right? Right. I high five the fans. Yes. Back and I hold my hands like this. Lil Wayne Gretzky. Emma, I lost fantasy this week by barely a fraction. The final score was 142.32 to 141.98. Needed oh, Judy terrible. to go farther last night, but oh well. Ugh, I'm sorry. Shout out to your awesome new show and the music is fire. Love the sense. Thank you. Um, Vermont Ben. MetLife looks like the condensing unit of a residential air conditioner. Absolutely <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Um... Boomer Socialist, speaking of the field, two Ravens went down to season-ending injuries in MetLife. Yeah, so let's talk about the Jets game um, because Bradley was there. Let's talk about it. Bradley, you were at the Jets game. Uh, It was raining. The Ravens handled business as everyone understood that they would. Lamar Jackson uh, did not rush for a touchdown, but he did throw for a few, and he looked... Like Lamar Jackson, uh, even in, even the in man, like, even in like terrible conditions, he looked like Lamar Jackson. Like he he broke off he broke off for a run that from the vantage point of my seats, I thought they tackled him. Then I saw him emerge from five guys and he <sighs> ran like thirty five yards. He had an amazing throw for a touchdown because I, I can't remember if it was to, if it was to Devin Duvernay, who to his great credit, I, if, I would love to know if anybody was starting Devin Duvernay because he happened to have two touchdowns yeah. against the Jets. I'm not even sure if he's had a two touchdown game in his entire career. Career. Um, None to and, Mark Andrews, right? Then the other no, one was, it was to, to, to Bateman, to, to Rashad Bateman, Bateman. Yeah, yeah. So, which is interesting, and maybe should quell some of the uh, the the negative talk from the receivers about Baltimore as a as a bad destination for yeah. receivers because Lamar can sling it. Lamar can throw no, the ball. The 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 the, the, the deep ball that that deep ball that he had that for the touchdown was a beautiful beautiful throw, and. From the Jets' perspective, it is an embarrassment. It is a disgrace. 
it is unacceptable to be starting 37-year-old Joe Flacco who because I understand that Zach Wilson is injured. Flacco is playing like the worst quarterback in the entire league, and he should not be playing for a professional team. He can't move. He can't pass. He can't do anything that a quarterback is supposed to be doing. He's 37 years old. Does I thought that his arm looked fairly strong in the preseason, but it didn't look good yesterday, or it, it didn't look good in person. He he couldn't he couldn't see open he couldn't see open receivers. Mm. He him scrambling looked like he had cinder blocks tied to his feet. Um, it was one of the worst in person football play foot like people playing football I have seen. I've been to a lot of bad Jets games before. I'm sorry. Um, they do they did what they did best, which is uh, refuse to recover fumbles. Corey Davis, Elijah Moore could not stop dropping balls, even though ostensibly they're being paid to be wide receivers. So uh, catching the ball is the whole thing. And um, Robert Sala was complaining about how everyone was saying that they were bad when they looked like shit. So you know when you if it talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So kind of uh, a blessing maybe that Russell, uh, that not Russell Wilson, that a. Uh, Zach Wilson is going to be coming back in week four or five, right? Because this they play who next? The Patriots? Who's next? Let me pull up their schedule. I mean, they haven't... I, I've pointed this out a bunch of times on the show. They're but, playing Cleveland next. Okay. That is fairly winnable because maybe Cleveland uh is uh but it's it's in cleveland the issue the issue i'm really having though is the, is the same but then thing. the Bengals and the steelers yeah, and the dolphins it's... and the packers and the broncos and the patriots and the bills and the it snowballs against... from there yeah, yeah yeah the issue i have though is 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 with is with the flacco decision broadly which is that you had a you had a practice squad quarterback and in, in chris trevler who is not anybody to write home about but was at least younger than flacco and more proficient looking than flacco was so to me i'm like this seems like a move from the organization that they think that this is what you're supposed to do. Capital S supposed to do, which is have a veteran be the backup quarterback until your young guy gets back from injury. But he's terrible. So I yeah. don't know why supposed to has anything to do with it. And so it's kind of a fear based move too. it's, it's absolutely a fear based of move. an ownership, uh, an owner who is impulsive and fires people quickly. Right. And again, same thing in the same thing. Listen, Mike White, again, not anything to write home about. I mean, he had, he had the game of his life beating the Bengals last year. I, and, but at the same time, I'm thinking what I saw in person, anything would be better than that. And so the other thing that I'll say though, in, in terms of positives, fortunately, is that Michael Carter and Brees Hall looked good running the ball. Um, Sauce looked sauce in a, in a few of the plays he had really did look great. He kind of he kind of had a few plays where he really did lock up Mark Andrews, which is no easy feat mm -hmm. even for a seasoned wow. cornerback. And um, DJ Reed got an inter interception. Um, you know there were a few there were a few bright spots and I think things to build on. But the offensive line is still a huge concern. They're still they're they're rookie fourth round or fifth round uh, tackle Max Mitchell was playing because both Dwayne Brown, who they signed essentially off the scrap heap and Mackay Becton are both out and Lakin Tomlinson, who they saw, who they signed in the off season did not look good. That has to improve if they want any chance of being competitive. And I just do not think this is the answer until Zach Wilson is back. This is a lost season for them, unfortunately, <laughs> but I'm hoping that they're just a little bit more patient and give Zach Wilson and this coaching staff a season that isn't from the outset so besieged by a, t a really disadvantageous schedule and um, an injury to their starting quarterback, which sucks. You know, it sucks. So I I'm I'm rooting for for Zach Wilson and the Jets because I just want you guys to not have another situation where the quarterback a high quarterback pick doesn't pick because it doesn't pan out because I think Zach Wilson has the talent to be really good. And the big issue and the biggest issue that I going forward in terms of long-term, even beyond this season or anything in terms of like a bird's eye view is that although it hasn't translated on the field in terms of team building, and I think in terms of culture building, the duo of Robert Sala and Joe Douglas have given this organization the most like, like, structural stability that they've had in like literally 10 to 12 years. Are you and, like Mike McCagnan? Yeah. Yeah. The Mike McCagnan or John Idzik or Mike Tannenbaum three, like, you know, three like complete con artists, like yeah. as the, as the heads of the front office and, you know, Aaron Mangini and Gase and Bowles, you know, like 
this is the most stability this team has had in ages. And my concern is that the like delusional expectations of New York team owners will come for the Johnson family as well. And they will basically be like, we're not competing for a Super Bowl. We need to fire these guys. Yeah. And they're not realizing they would without them realizing that firing them is the exact reason and the exact pattern that leads to people that leads to teams not winning championships. Okay. I hope you got that out of your system. Yeah, this is like going to confession. <laughs> um, and then we'll do it again next week. <laughs> and the week after. <laughs> also, I don't know if anyone remembers from last week, but Nick Mangle did actually come to the tailgate I was at, and I missed it. Oh, my God. Well, so someone I went to high school with, <laughs> I saw posted a photo of her with uh, with Nick Mangold. So it, I was like, oh, Bra- maybe Bradley knows her, but nope, not you. Nope, not me. I missed it. Ah. My friend kept trying to have him hold the ball and snap it to him, and he literally got like angry at my friend. He was like, "Do not." He was like, "I will not touch the ball. Like, leave me alone." <laughs> it's like, "Sorry, bro." <laughs> okay. <laughs> Too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last game I really want to dive into. I mean, I'm not gonna. <laughs> For some reason, I just there, there. There's too much to get to, and the the Chiefs defeating the Cardinals. That was one of my locks of the week. Minus seven. I knew that was going to happen. Um, the Commanders defeating the Jags. I mean, I I'm rooting for the Jags for some reason. I I, I want Trevor Lawrence to to have success, but you know he's still finding his way. It's a new offensive system. They looked better than they did under Urban Meyer, but the floor was. Uh, uh, the floor was the core of the earth. Um, the the so and this is the this is the experience of having Carson Wentz as your quarterback. He's probably going to put up some decent numbers at the start of the year and then start throwing interceptions. And he brought them down. Like he threw a variety of interceptions. I thought thought that the Jags were going to come back, but they did not. Um, the Colts and the Texans tie. That is the least interesting game of the entire slate. Uh, mentioned. No, the, I think the one I was at was the least interesting. Perhaps one. <laughs> at least um, that one tied. At least that one was close. <laughs> <laughs> the I couldn't believe how good Wentz looked, honestly, and I mean that yeah. sincerely. I was like shocked that he actually looked like relative, and he had a great throw to Jahan Dotson, like for a touchdown. Like I was waiver wire pickup. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That 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 I think is smart. At least I think I think it's he's clearly involved in the offense enough where it's not just going to be McLaurin. He's so, a first round pick. They want him. Oh yeah. Him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I I was impressed by that, and I still and again I think with the week one caveat as I keep hammering home I think there still is room for Lawrence to improve and I think there were some glimmers where he genuinely had like in terms of decision making and and ball placement looked genuinely um t- like further top tier than than we were kind of we were kind of expecting with the first overall pick but um I just think that team is a very weirdly constructed team and is just going to have to like figure a lot of stuff out as the season continues Yes, um, and the the same that we we address this at the start, but the Vikings beat the Packers as well, and the they looked really good. Yeah, like I I couldn't believe I was I was I don't know why I was so shocked with the presence given the presence of Justin Jefferson, but like the whole team looked really good. I was like so I could I was very yeah. impressed. Well, Kirk Cousins has thrived in this kind of offense before under under Kyle Shanahan, um, right? Uh, and so, if you ha- if Kevin O'Connell can, can keep this up with uh, in terms of creativity, maybe maybe they can have success. Um, the whole, that whole division is super weak to me, but um, but I, I think the Packers will eventually be fine. I think they're going to end up winning that division in the end. But I, I agree. I, I I'm still. I think we're. I think it's not off base to stick with that. But if you recall in our first episode, I said that I think that this is a closer call in terms of like the Vikings could actually win this thing. So I stand by that. Um, And if they're able to maintain this and Justin Jefferson is able to play like an MVP candidate, an MVP candidate, then we'll see. I I mean, I think it was his second touchdown, but but he literally juked out like two two crossing corners and was just wide open. Is there anyone close in that top two in terms of receivers right now, Jamar Chase or, or Justin Jefferson? Like, the thing is, no, because I think last year when we were kind of, at least I think the conversation was in terms of both for like all pro, pro bowl, whatever. Between you and me? No, between you and me, but also just generally. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, it was basically, 
J- like Jamar Jefferson and Debo. And Debo to me, one is more like his utility doesn't only reside in him as a receiver. And also I don't know how replicable that season exactly. is. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas, whereas Jefferson and Chase to me, it's like, so that's skills. a receivers, yeah, receivers, absolutely, right? And, and their skill, and their skills, and and their skills, and 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 body type, and like savvy, I just think are like head and shoulders above the rest of the league. And I, except for Cup, of course, Cup is I think maybe the only person I would I would also include. Obviously, I but. would, but I think there's a I, I, Cup is really really good. But part of me is like, how much does he benefit from that offense oh. being so perfect for him? Um, and his skill set in particular, like you could put Justin Jefferson and you did, you put Justin Jefferson in Mike Zimmer's terrible, I, terrible. Right. O- I mean, it wasn't his offensive system. He didn't seem to really even be involved in it. But when Zimmer was at the helm of that team and he did not, he neglected the offense seemingly entirely, Justin Jefferson was still phenomenal. And now you put him with an offensive coach in terms of right now. And I'm not talking about past production guys. Like, I understand that fantasy can skew these things, but Devontae Adams, no. Um, Stefan Diggs, no. Physically, just watch these guys in terms of how they look compared to Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. There's n- Those two guys, you can put them in, on any team, and they would have more success than a lot of other players. I, I, those other receivers, Debo, Diggs, Cup, um, Devonte, Re- Tyreek, really, really good, but for right now in 2022, I-, I don't think it's particularly close. And those two guys are just head and shoulders above everyone else. And don't get me wrong, Devonte really did look great this week. He had a, he had one unbelievable route where he literally yeah. had had had. Uh, um, I, I might have been. A, I think it might have been Asante Samuel Jr. Just literally like like turned backwards. Totally juked him and, out. Um, but I think it's also it also just might be partially an aesthetic pre- preference. But I really just think it's also just like watching these guys. Like, I think seeing Jefferson the way Jefferson played yesterday, and also just seeing how Chase played all of last season. I think I'm taking both of those guys if I wanted a cornerstone wide receiver, and I'm I'm like rostering a football team. I think I'm still taking those two guys over Devontae. Uh, now yeah absolutely. yes and also they're think, younger and age too i think age is a big factor as well like, and i would have t- I, I would even in Devonte's heyday i think they're better than him i mean I'm, I'm sorry like they get more separation chase it's way more separation i take chase first i mean i, I just think the size and yeah that's speed, the thing he's the best receiver in football yeah, I, but, he, but he's jefferson's amazing too right he's essentially untacklable yeah chase. like he's he's so he he can he can shake he shake like it's almost impossible for me to understand how exactly you game plan for a guy like Jamar Chase. You can't. Like, how do you actually bring him down consistently? How do you cover him consistently? How do you block him? Uh, how do you keep him out of the red zone? It's like, he is like a cheat code. And and he was part of the reason that this, the, the Bengals were still in it despite those five turnovers. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, and they couldn't, they could, the Steelers, despite being so well coached on the decent offensive side of the ball, could not stop him. Couldn't stop him. Could not stop him. I, and they are incredible. And LSU just churns yeah, these guys out. Literally. <laughs> like wide receiver university is, is LSU. <laughs> and Jamar Chase, you know, he, de- he's in Cincinnati, he's such a small market, Minnesota, definitely a bigger market. But in terms of like the way Jefferson does the gritty and you see all these kids like Vikings fans doing it too on the internet and loving him so much, I don't think there's been a more marketable receiver for young people since Odell Beckham Jr. was in New York. And there's a difference because New York is this huge market. But think about it in terms of like how how the youths, and I try to keep up with it, but just how people are responding to a guy just having so much swag and charisma charisma and dominance yeah and, and just and, and backing it all up with his talent on the field the one thing i will say just quickly about the steelers bengals game guys i know like like we said light light betting recommendations nothing crazy but whatever the odds are for maybe minka fitzpatrick being in the defensive player of mm-hmm. the year uh year uh category i mean he was everywhere he put that team on his back because the offense could do nothing could, with that were... offensive line it's terrible i mean Deont- listen deontay johnson had an unbelievable catch but again like you you can't rely on that, those high variance outcomes for good offense 
Fitzpatrick kept that team single handedly in competition with with the with the Bengals. What a stud. Blocking that extra point or whatever field goal, field goal, I don't remember which one was truly like was one of the like craziest. And I mean, don't get any, of course, with the caveat that the Bengals long snapper was injured. So they had to bring in a guy like a backup tight end to serve as long yeah. snapper. But the but that's the thing. When you're a smart, good defense and it's well coached in a well coached team and a, and with a great player like Fitzpatrick, you immediately capitalize on that. That's stuff. why you can never count the Steelers out. I mean, that's why I didn't think they would win that game, but I thought they'd keep it close. And plus six and a half, they did, right? Um, even with Trubisky and that line. It's just, it, this is why Tomlin is so good. Tomlin is so good. It, it blows my mind that he gets disrespected every year just because he's been around. People get tired of that same, of somebody being so good for so long, I feel like. It's almost kind of like that Popovich kind of thing where it not, we're not, I'm not directly comparing to, but I'm, I'm sort of being, I'm They're sort of saying, similar. But I'm sort of saying in the sense of like, for like coach of the year or plot, it's like that, you could kind of always make a case that he's like a contender for it just by virtue of essentially put anyone in his, his on his team and they will be like marginally competitive. Yeah. And last thing I'll say too is the Chargers, <sighs> This is my last... I'm going to take calls right after this. But, um, man, Khalil Mack, <laughs> I was happy to see it. I was happy to see it. I... I, I... My... My... My Chargers... My Chargers standing and my, my pick for my Super Bowl pick, I am still... I am still firmly, firmly on the train. I'm, I'm still riding the Chargers wave. And, and think about that, that trade, too, from the Raiders. And I don't think they necessarily... From what I've read, it seemed like just the... Mark Davis and maybe was Al still alive at that time? I don't remember, but um, they didn't have the cash on hand, I think, to pay him or something like that. So they traded him to the Bears. And I, I looked this up before the show who they um, who, who they still who they got in 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 that trade, but they got Josh Jacobs, who's struggling. They. Had got a corner in the sixth round. I don't really count that. But then they also wasted that other first rounder on Damon Arnett, who was not considered to be a first round talent. This was like the Galaxy Brain Gruden first round pick, and um, that it, it goes to show that sometimes you just pay a guy if you can. It seems like the Raiders couldn't, but that's whole, I mean, or they say that at least, right? Like I'm sure the Davises could have made it work, but. Like the, the sometimes you just pay a guy. And Arnett almost immediately got into legal trouble as well. So it's not even it's not even as if like it you know you look at the you look at some of these these previous draft picks. Henry Ruggs is is a, 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 you know a very unfortunate situation. Yeah. He's probably going to jail for a very long time. Arnett had his own legal problems that I don't believe is still with the team or is not playing prominently with the team. Alex Leatherwood is was cut and is on the Bears now. I mean, they've just had many... Also not considered to be a first-round pick like, taken like, by... There was such institutional arrogance where we were like, we're only going to We know take, more. Mike Mayick and I know more. We're taking guys from big schools. We're taking SEC guys. And, like, and, right. and, and we know better. And as long as you're scrappy, we're going to take you. I mean, Cleveland Farrell was Cleland Farrell, also we were talking about. Yeah. an idiotic pick. And just because he was on that championship team with clemson i think they might have won the championship that year or went but to he it wasn't or were great i forget right. but, but he wasn't even considered I, I don't even think from that team like one of the like, no! like in terms of like the defensive players like he was probably not even the highest touted player certainly not i think there were a few I, if i'm remembering correctly a few big boards where like he was not in the top 10, let alone a fourth overall pick. So I just think it also, like you said, it just shows the organizational dysfunction where you have numerous high-profile draft picks that are not only not playing well, they're not even on the team anymore. That's like when you actually look at asset management, it's such a sunk cost. It's such a waste. It's such a setback for the organization. And I'm not, and I think like hopefully McDaniels can like, you know, kind of right the right the ship for them, and I think this car Devonte connection can lead to some encouraging you know outcomes. But I, they, they they even they still have to like, kind of like make their way back from some of that like impotence organizationally as well. That's the thing is is like I can't pick the Raiders to make the playoffs this year, and I didn't because they just have the least talented team in the in, in the div stacked in the division, division. Yeah. and the division is stacked and um. 
they they have Devontae Adams, they have Darren Waller, great you know pass catchers, and I, I'm I'm Hunter such Renfro. a such a huge Darren Waller fan. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, Hunter Renfro as well, and Josh McDaniels is going to make the offense really creative and good, and I get it, but they they don't have the the Jimmys and the Joes as they say, and um, that's because of of a, a mismanaged front office under Gruden and Mayock, uh, and even before that. So, before that, it was Jack Del Rio, who's now say, spouting MAGA talking points and hey, defending January 6th. An aspiring insurrectionist. <laughs> um, so, just giving, giving you a sense of how things have gone down there. And I, I, I defend Derek Carr, uh, even though he, like Russell Wilson, is corny as hell. But, there, but, but at least, you know, Carr does have some scrappiness to him that I appreciate. And I can't. Justin Herbert... He should have been a giant. That, that moron idiot went back to school because he wanted to play with his brother. Uh, what a loser. Uh, oh, oh, how cute. You, know, you want to play with uniform. your brother? Uh, uh, like, what? Well, you love your brother? What an asshole oh, what, you, love you your brother are. Or something? Uh, yeah. You love your family or something? Uh, like, totally gay of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, jo- I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. I'm just disappointed Bum. that he's not uh-huh. in the Giants. So, um, but. But yeah, I'm I'm bummed out. But he's uh, he's amazing, and I I he, that, that, pass that 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 pass when with with literally between two defenders going into the end zone, I was like, that is that should be impossible. It like it was one of one. He's 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 a top five quarterback for sure, for sure. And don't take any analyst seriously if they say otherwise. But um. But it is. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm disappointed he's not a giant because he is incredible. He is incredible. All right, let's start taking some calls. Calling from a six three area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Six three zero. Oh, this is uh, Pat from Miami. How you doing? Hi, Pat. How are you? Good. You are the first, the first ever caller, caller for. Yeah. ESPN. That's awesome. Uh, congratulations <laughs> on the show. Uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so I, you guys have talked a lot about uh, the NFL. Unfortunately, my favorite team would be the Lions. Mm. Uh, so if it's possible, can I talk about college for a minute? Sure. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. No, it's fine. Uh, Pat, you live in Miami and you're a Lions fan? Well, I grew up in the Midwest. Oh, I gotcha. grew up in okay. school with uh, Michigan. So, gotcha. Um, gotcha. Which is, I would kind of want to throw out a prediction here. Uh, I think that uh, assuming J.J. McCarthy is the starter, I think Michigan's going to beat Ohio State this year. Ooh, that is a hot take. Wow. So what, didn't yeah, J.J. I, McCarthy, uh, did he have some sort of um, injury or am I wrong? He had a uh, – it was like an overuse thing with with his shoulder, and it was in uh, spring camp. But I think he had surgery, and he got it corrected. Nice, so nice. Okay. He, yeah, he started um, He started the second game uh, this past week. He was 11 for 12. His only uh, incompletion was a drop. I think he put like three or four 30-plus yard balls in the air. Um, I mean, his upside, he'll be – I think he'll be a Heisman front runner next year. Um. He's got like, I mean, potential upside. He could be like Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. I mean, he's like Michigan's never had a quarterback like that. I mean, not since like Denard, but uh, I mean, it's kind of what was missing from their offense. Cause like McNamara is great. Um, like he, he beat Ohio state last year. They won the conference. He's a great leader, but he's kind of like constrained in the pocket. Um, and actually I saw them in the orange bowl last year. Um, and it was just like he couldn't get anything done. And mm-hmm. It was just like Georgia just pinned their ears back. They're in the backfield right away. Um, and when they put McCarthy in, actually, they got a, a little bit done. A little. I mean, it was still Georgia. They were overmatched. But uh, I think they can do it this year. So, um, so I mean, he seems he's not he's not small, but he probably could put on some weight. I guess. Um, I just you, you find his kind of. Uh, it, it, him to be a bit more elusive. Um, I'm like more of a casual college football person, so I'm genuinely asking. 
Yeah, he's a. Uh, I mean, I don't know his measurables, but he. I mean, he could probably put on another 10, 15 pounds. I'm going to guess, but he he's got a lot more speed. Like they put him in last week, and they did a read option, and like he just like blew past the linebacker. It was like 20 yard rushing touchdown. It was like the guy was just standing there. Ah. Uh-huh. Um. And so, I mean, it just like it opens up their whole offense because like actually in the game uh, this past week they put McNamara in and in, in like the second half when the game was already over. It's like four two to nothing, and. Uh, like Hawaii just they start stacking the box, they start doing more effective pass rush, and it's like it's like Michigan couldn't move the ball again. Mm. And when McCarthy's in, it's like they're spreading the field. They've got to kind of respect the uh, the run ability. He gets the ball out a lot quicker. Um, he's unbelievably accurate. Um, and I just, man, I don't know. I mean, I saw some of the Ohio State and Notre Dame game, and like, yeah, they look vulnerable. Notre Dame looks. Yeah, and Notre Dame also looks like really bad. I know it was, it was um, that game was a slog. That game was a slog, and I and the Florida game was on at the same time, and I was really interested in watching uh, uh, Anthony Richardson. So the but that that was that had me a little concerned about Ohio State. Yeah, and I remember like last year when I saw the Oregon game uh, with Ohio State, I was just like, all they did was they attacked the or, Oregon attacked the edge, and like Ohio State couldn't compensate. And I remember thinking last year, like, you know, these guys look a little bit vulnerable, and we might actually be able to beat them this year, and then we pulled it off. And I just, I don't know, I'm just getting the same kind of vibes. All right. Well, uh, you were on record, Pat, from Miami, and uh, we'll call back in if that's the case. Pat, uh, good luck this season with the Lions, and if you uh, call back, if you uh, have any have any uh, battles where you where you take someone's kneecap off and and uh, and, uh, get get them on one get them on one leg. Anytime the Lions are mentioned, uh, everyone in sports media is contractually obligated to mention the kneecap thing. The kneecap, the the one butt cheek. Yeah. Dan Campbell is a total psycho in the best way. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. yeah. I hope he stays there for a while. Me too. Um, he needs a quarterback. But uh, yeah. yeah. Well, there, that's a whole different thing. I, I could go on about the Lions. Like the, and it doesn't matter how well coached you are when you have that guy as your quarterback, honestly. So, mm-hmm. um, exactly. all right. Appreciate it, Pat. Cool. Thanks for taking my call. Bye. All right. Calling from, calling from a 262 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Josh from Chicago. Josh from Chicago, it is? Yeah, from Chicago. Oh, Jack, sorry. Okay, we have a regular okay. caller called Josh from Chicago, so I got a bit confused. Apologies. I'm calling about the Bears and kind of what you guys were talking about last week with the rebuild model. I think we're still not going to be great this year, and I think what you said last week was really intelligent and really right, and the building from the offensive line Mm. but with polls i think and i'm sorry last week i said we said ryan pace 400 times we meant ryan polls because that's confusing because pace is the previous previous regime (laughs) yeah they replaced a a coach matt with a coach matt and a gm ryan with a GM. right right exactly (laughs) but i think the the one thing with polls that i like is he doesn't really have that executive speak where you can tell they're okay with good teams being cyclical. Mm. You can tell he's pissed we're not going to be great this year. Sorry, I have COVID. I'm a little sick. But... Oh, feel better. I'm sorry. <sighs> Thank you. Um, I think clearly he's had an ego with the draft and saying, I know who I am as a player evaluator. I'm going to take the best available. And then down the line, I'm going to try to fill in the puzzle with who we don't get. And I think that's something with you as a Giants fan seeing the Saquon pick and just sort of the fantasy think tank with how undervalued the offensive line is. I think people who know football, that pendulum can kind of come back a little too far. Mm. And I just think Poles has done a great job with the roster he got handed. So I think the Bears are going to be a team to watch. Like year two, year three of this regime, this is the first time I've ever seen a light at the end of the tunnel with the Bears. Well, here's my other thing I'll, I'll flow to you because I, I, I am encouraged about the Bears for the first time in a long time, given the fact that Ted Phillips, the president and CEO of the Bears, um, is going to be retiring, who seems to have have his hand 
in a lot of these picks that are like for for personnel or uh, not for personnel but for for coaching and staff that are 15 20 years outdated and so hopefully polls who was my second choice or honestly i was happy with him or joe shane but it seemed like the giants were going to go with shane from the get-go um but I really liked Poles as a potential general manager pick for the Giants. So the Bears, I mean, he, he seems to have a really good record and philosophy. And he's a former offensive lineman. And and I will and yeah. what I'll and what I'll say too is that is that um one, I think you have the right idea in terms of there is something to be said when you kind of see an, an attitude an attitude shift in terms of like genuinely uh, the GM genuinely wanting the team to improve and wanting the team to be better. And also even though maybe I would have probably have preferred that they try a little harder to sign either another to sign a receiver to replace Allen Robinson, um, that in, in a, and also in a way where they weren't only just going to kind of over overreach for Valus Jones. Um, I'm still heartened by the fact that I think Jahan Brisker and Kyler Gordon are both good picks. I think they'll fill out. I think they'll be good depth pieces for their defense. And they just looked honestly fr- much friskier in this first game in in bad conditions than I ever than I anticipated. So yeah, good coaching it seems like. And correct me if I correct me if I'm wrong, Jack. I think after the season they're going to have a significant um a significantly larger amount of cap space to give them a little bit more flexibility or latitude to actually make bigger moves in the off season. I thought, I thought maybe they'll be shedding Khalil Mack's uh, contract finally after this. Am, am I mistaken? No, you're right. And there's a lot of, a lot of other deals with that. The Nick Foles deal, Tariq Cohen, Eddie oh. Goldman, oh. Danny Trevathan, all those horrible contracts. Oh are God, it's still on the books. books, Danny Trevathan. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was bad with pace. Um, and by the well, way, I understand your pain because Leonard Williams just had to be restructured so that he's going to have an over $30 million cap hit <laughs> yes year, paid more than Aaron Donald and Kenny Galladay, like can't get off the line and is being paid like he's, you know, a top 15 receiver in the league. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we're, yeah. all of our teams suck, I think. So <laughs> maybe <laughs> but I think with bring this together. I think with the wide receiver thing, and I know that's been a point of contention with polls, I think the Christian Kirk deal really reset the market with that and with how much he got per year in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. And then all the dead money that the Bears had, I just think, like, yeah, they're not great in terms of receiving weapons, but I think polls did as much as he could with the team he got handed. And then our biggest free agent signing being Ogan Joby, who failed a physical, and then all that money went into limbo for – you know, the couple weeks or whatever that was. So I just, I think Pulse has done a great job. And I think the Bears are a little slept on publicly. Well, in turn, I I'm, uh, feel better, by the way. I'm going to let you go. But um, I, I, I'm hoping that this regime just holds on to Justin Fields and tries to build around him. Because I, I, and that, like, they can get through this year with not really having ideal weapons. And that that's, his development will just continue to go up and up because if it's a bad, if it's as bad of a team as say, you know, uh, I, there have been a lot of examples with the Jets and the Giants in particular. Um, but like that, it can hurt a quarterback's development. The situation is as, as important as the talent. And so I like Justin Fields so much. I really don't want that to happen for him. Yeah. I think he's going to be good. I think they're committed to him too. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to watching him. All right. Appreciate it. Feel better with your COVID. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Calling from an 804 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Jeremy from Richmond, Virginia. He's a resident of Dirt Devil. Jeremy from Virginia. Uh, Dirt Devil. Oh, it's Dirt Devil. Yeah, What's my up? my friend, Dirt Devil. Hey, Dirt Devil. Hey, hey uh, just wanted to call in, congratulate you first on your own show. Thanks. Um, so good with that. Um, as you probably tell from my dirty voice, I'm not much of a sports person, so more interested in the uh, politics of it all. So uh, I've been trying to get my friend who doesn't follow politics and is a big NFL fan to start watching your show. So hopefully <laughs> he can be open up to some ideas. Uh, he grew up in Florida, so he's kind of got some like conservative reflexes and Florida brain. But I was hoping um, maybe you could recap the whole Brian Flores situation or just what's going on with the Dolphins. So that's his team. Uh, I was trying to tell him about the time and I was watching Majority Report, and uh, he just 
just has the worst reaction and takes to that type of stuff. Like the NFL didn't find issues of discrimination, therefore there was none. Mm. Um, and just other weird takes. But I feel like he's getting a lot of conservative takes on like sports on YouTube because he doesn't watch much politics directly. So uh, I'll answer this question, Jared Devil, and thanks for calling in. Um, if... Yeah, I could take it off the air. Okay, cool. Um, so in terms of for your friend uh, that you might be skeptical for these for some of these kinds of claims, Brian Flores' lawsuit was essentially centered around the fact that Stephen Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins, as you may know, friend of Daredevil, um, had essentially asked Brian Flores to tank and that he would pay him sums of money and I think it's like a hundred thousand dollars for every game that he lost now um the there has at least been one corroborating source according to some some media reports hearing this uh who was able to back up his claims and the NFL was able to find that yes Stephen Ross violated one of the two uh or actually did um do one of the two things essentially that brian flores said in his accusations which was that he tampered with tom brady and was trying really hard to get tom brady into the fold and into the team on multiple occasions when he left the patriots and um, was leaving the patriots and when he was on the bucks so they desperately wanted tom brady in town they were the NFL because Flores was is suing the NFL and Stephen Ross and the Dolphins didn't concede that second part, but they said basically and commended Flores in their um, discipline of Stephen Ross and conceded that that part was true. But they're not going to say anything about the racial discrimination part and the tanking accusations. And the tanking is inextricably tied to the racism. And I know that that's maybe not something that seems intuitive when you're thinking about it but 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 think about it like this sometimes nfl head coaches get hired and they are black think about how many nfl head coaches have been hired to teams that were expected to succeed that were black it's not really a long list really is not a long list we're seeing it kind of right now with the Houston Texans, a notoriously uh, bigoted organization, I'll be real. They hired David Culley, a black head coach, and when they were um, named in Flores' lawsuit as well, they hired Lovey Smith, who has not been coaching for many years, and they don't plan on being very good this year either. Brian Flores was asked to tank. This was his first opportunity as an NFL head coach, or it was alleged, and he's he's claiming that, even though one of his secondary claims already corroborated, already proved by the NFL, but they can't admit to the racial discrimination part. This would be something that would ruin his future employment for years and years. You get hired based on your win-loss record as a second head coach. Usually you only get one chance, and especially if you have a terrible win-loss record, you're, you're not going to get a second bite at the apple uh, as an NFL head coach. And so you'll often see this be the case. Black head coaches don't necessarily get hired when they're expected to win. They'll get hired as placeholders. They'll get hired as guys. And when teams are, 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 are falling apart, Hugh Jackson tried to make a similar claim as well. And to me, uh, I think that's fairly clear about what the Browns are trying to do there. A lot, it doesn't need to be explicit, but these owners who are billionaires and they're all non-black, they, in their mind, probably just have a vision of the kind of guy that's going to lead my team and the kind of guy that I like, but we know we're not going to be very good right now and I want us to be set up in a position to be good when we hire the right guy. And in the case of the Dolphins, that was Sean Payton. That was Sean Payton. And in, and. That was a part of the proven, proven tampering accusations in Brian Flores' claim against the NFL. So that part was already understood. And friend of Daredevil, just look at the proportion of black players to black head coaches in this league. It's, it makes no sense.
if you're looking at it completely logically, it makes no sense, right? These black players know the game. They're in it. They've been a part of it their entire lives. Why does every white guy that sniffs Sean McVay's ass, essentially, <laughs> or breathe the same air as him, get a head coaching opportunity? Why has Eric Bieniemy, I was just going to say, who has been a part of the Chiefs' roaring success, Super Bowl winning offensive coordinator, why has he not got any serious looks at that position? Byron Leftwich. Leslie, Another. Leslie Frazier is still not a head coach. He's still with the Bills. Yeah. And he, and he has been. And he just, but he has been. But the point is, he hasn't been again. That was back to back black offensive coordinators who won the Super Bowl in the Chiefs and then the Bucks the years after that. And who gets the credit in that, at least with Byron Leftwich? Oh, it's, it's Arians and Brady. It's Brady, right? No, Byron Leftwich was able, and by the way, doesn't seem like Brady liked Arians very much. He likes working with Byron Leftwich. And and but credit to Arians in that in that particular regard, and that he always kind always. of shepherded uh, Leftwich in terms of like tutelage and having him be his protege and really advocating for him. And there really are not that many coaches who do that for their, especially for black assistants and black associates, you know, in in in, co- in coaching trees and things like that. Yeah, no, Arians is 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 a good good guy um one of the good good ones in terms of that uh, but, in that regard but take the texan situation like you were saying that essentially they hired cully as a essentially a placeholder he didn't even get a ch- he didn't even get the chance to to continue anything with an absolutely terrible team he didn't get to actually try and build anything because he got such a short leash and they had what five wins or four wins he, um, might even have been three. Again, uh, I, don't I don't know, know, but either way, they looked more competent than they should have under his. Uh, exactly, yeah. absolutely. Like, like, like they did. Like even Davis, even Davis Mills, who was not a highly touted quarterback prospect, looked significantly better than I ever thought he would have looked under David Cully. Then the reporting was that Josh McCown, who had literally, who has literally never coached in any None. capacity was considered to be the finalist for the head co- one of the finalists for the Texans head coaching job because he goes to church with the GM. And and right, and that's why they the the not not even the GM, right? Is or the, the whatever the play Easterby, the, play, Easterby, the player the, the player the shaman. The worm tongue yeah. who is in uh in the owner's ear constantly praying for him and praying with him and all this stuff. It's it's like the reason that they didn't hire Josh McCown and it seemed like they were onto it was because then your optics uh, uh, <laughs> then after that was being reported and he was being included, like it was so ridiculous that uh, after Brian Flores' lawsuit hit, they were unable to to make it work. They Look over there. We a... hired Lovey Smith. <laughs> yeah, who hasn't? Who was? What was he last at? Eastern Illinois. He was as at a Illinois, coach? And, and I think went like six, like eight and fifteen or something as their head coach. And nothing against Lovey Smith. I mean, he really was one of the innovators of defensive coaching this century, basically. But but it just seems Illinois, yeah. it just seems so morally and ethically bankrupt to very transparently telegraph your ambitions to hire an unqualified nepotism product white head coach and then when a scandal happens about racism in the nfl turn tail and hire a black guy yeah mind pillow guy says brian flores's lawsuit also alleges that the giants and the broncos set up sham interviews with him for head coach just to satisfy the nfl's rooney role which requires clubs to interview at least one black candidate yeah i mean the giants when they hired Shane, knew they were hiring Brian Dayball, 100%. You'll recall Bill Belichick texting Brian Flores and saying, oops, wrong Brian. Wrong Brian. When he realized Whoops. that actually it was Brian Dayball who got the job. And Flores, who received that text after this, his interview, thinking he was still in contention, was told, was notified by his former boss that he had accidentally texted the incorrect Brian, the white Brian, who got that head coaching job And instead. the Giants of all of these organizations are perceived to be as one of the most respectable and like it, you know forward thinking in some of those areas not maybe forward thinking but at least like they treat their guys right and even they have this problem they have this problem and the problem is is because is that black coaching candidates are not treated and taken seriously in the same way and the giants can say all they want about this which is like we didn't want to go with another new england type guy we didn't want to know go with another hard-nosed guy which i think is true but then okay eric bianami 
Why didn't you interview him? Why didn't you interview Byron Leftwich? Right? Like there is a problem around the league, and there's a there, there is like this implicit bias that oh, a, a black guy can't be an offensive guru. That's for white guys uh, with their with their computers and their analytics. No, I, I mean this is this is part of the systemic racism of the NFL. Oh, and sorry, someone I think it might have been uh, Tim Schultz in chat uh, uh, corre uh, may have corrected me that I'm not. Uh, but someone in chat, I hope they could confirm this. It might have been before he even had the interview, where yeah, uh, where, no, uh, or, uh, I'm, yes, I, I, it was, it was before. Like he, it might, he might not have even had the mm -hmm, chance. Mm -hmm, yeah, uh, Flores yeah. when Dable got the job. I mean, it hadn't been announced yet, but essentially, like maybe Dable was told behind the scenes, and we'll see if that's proven. But, um, but yeah, that uh, that is the reality, and um, and so hopefully, Dear Devil's friend. This this uh, this resonates with you a little bit. Keep watching and and hope and the Dolphins look pretty good in Week One, so I hope you're happy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna take one more call and then we're gonna get out of here. Calling from a three one two area code. We've gotta be quick. Hey, uh, is it me? Yes, this is you. Uh, this is Andrew. I'm from Chicago, but I'm calling from Bloomington, Indiana. Hi. Uh, Let's go, go Hoosiers, Hoosiers, baby. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to uh, give a little shout out to my Bears because I think that people are making too much of the weather in that game. Okay. Due to the way that we played in the second half before the torrential downpour started, because we had a two possession lead in the second half, 19 unanswered points, and then the rain started. At that point, point. I feel like the game was over. Mm. So. I mean, what I don't it, really know. Yeah, maybe I look, honestly, uh, it was it's hard for uh, I'm taking in 15 games at once. So perhaps my my idea of when the rain started is wrong. But like it, it does seem the Bears played sound and they seem to understand and take advantage of Lance's weaknesses. I, I also think that the, the sign for me that it was a well coached game was that we looked terrible in the first half and came out of halftime and looked like a different team. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's definitely part of Matt Aberflus's, you know, whole hit philosophy and everything like that. But I think that the Bears are going to be a, a sneaky good team that might pip somebody to second place in the division. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe a wild card if the really strong AFC, uh, you know, divisions really beat up on people and the interleague play and everything like that. But We'll, we'll see. I think that the Bears are going to be better than people think they are sooner than people think they will be. And I'm fine with being, you know, the national media is uh, nobody likes us because that's fine with me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we will we will keep monitoring that. Appreciate the call. Thanks so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Have a good one, guys. You too. A lot of Bears fans in the audience. Um, all right, we're going to, I'm sorry, guys, we're turning on the voicemail. We will take calls next week uh, and get to them probably sooner. Uh, it's just like there's so much to talk about in the NFL. It just really is. We didn't even get to any NBA stories and the Phoenix Suns owner and all that. But we will be, we'll be trickling those out. Um, on Thursday, Bradley and I will be giving our picks uh, on, on uh, a quick special segment. We're hoping to do that every Thursday um given our picks for the weekend but um i also should say that i think we are going to be moving espn to monday next week and for the foreseeable future so stay tuned for that i will be making it official probably just weighing some off. should we just make it official now we're gonna do it on mondays yeah. we're doing it on Mondays. i just think for us i think it makes sense because we can talk about the whole slate of the su of sunday and if we're going to do our picks on Thursday, we can talk about the Monday game then. Yeah. It just seems like more more sensible for our schedule. So we're not also like dishing our week takes or takes from the week before going into Wednesday morning. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So we're going to do it on Monday and we're then going to do our, our picks same time Thursday live here on the Majority Report channel. Um, and it'll be available podcast form everywhere you go. Uh, all right, we're gonna do. Ten, ten. Oh, oh, sorry, just didn't mean to interrupt you, Emma. Yeah. But I just wanted to make sure, just wanted to make sure everyone knows now that we are also, um, we are now like fully on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So that's nice. uh, that's all. That's all. Uh, and and you can go to ESV, uh, youtubecom slash ESVN show for clips and more stuff from there as well. So you know, we are we are are we are locked and loaded. Yes.
Let's ride. Um, go Hawks! Go Hawks! <laughs> That's my imitation of Russell Wilson. Fierce deity. I agree on the whole one. Kyle Shanahan is a good coach, but his decision to pass the ball in Super Bowl 51 well within the field goal range is an all-time botch. You run it twice to chew clock, kick the field goal, and the game is on ice. 28-3 to is not a thing. Even if you miss the kick, you have a good chance to win from chewing clock. Worse than the Seahawks passing the ball in Super Bowl 49, in my opinion, but I'm not complaining about it either. Yeah, I understand that. I just think the games, that games often come down to, like, that game shouldn't have come down to that decision um, because of the defense. Uh, Brennan from Kentucky. Levis versus Richardson occurred Sunday night. Levis was composed, took checkdowns, and won, uh, had one beautiful deep ball for a touchdown. Richardson has all the tools to be the best quarterback, but looked very unpolished and was lacking finesse on his passes. This is accurate. Yes, I watched some of those. Levis is ready for the NFL, but with m- some more seasoning, Richardson will be the higher ceiling bet. Brennan, you, uh, y- I totally agree with you, but Richardson hasn't played quarterback for as long as Will Levis has, so we'll see. Is they're both? They both have. I like them both better than C.J. Stroud and um, and uh, what's his name from from Ohio State, Bryce Young. Alabama's back, Bryce. Yes, yeah, Stroud's I from mean, Ohio State and Young is from hey, Alabama. Hey, it's six oh three. Um, Kowalski, ESVP is great. The two of you should get a Nerf football. You throw back and forth whenever a person starts talking. Need a gimmick. As many are aware, I'm not a big sports guy, though most of my friends are. They force me to pick a team in order to get interested in the NFL. About two months ago, I decided the Chiefs would be my team. I've been getting mocked for this choice, but I feel like I made a good choice. Thoughts? Less left is ESVN. Kowalski, I mean, like, yes, of course you made a good choice. They're, they're really good. So hopefully... If you're just if you want to get into the NFL, you should pick a good team to get in, invested in because otherwise you're not going to be that invested. Don't don't. I, I, anytime I meet somebody who is like from a different town or city and is like I'm a Jets fan, like they chose to be a Jets fan, <laughs> I'm like, you're worse than me. Yeah. At least it was passed down to me. Right. At least I inherited it. I didn't choose it. I mean, I fell in love with the Giants during those Super Bowl runs, so it's the easiest way to to really just fall in love with a team. Um, and they haven't won a playoff game in 10 years. Uh, and th- this is the first time they've been above 500 since the the playoff loss in Green Bay when there was the boat game and Odell and Sterling Shepard were on the boat. So, and Skip Bayless thought that was the end of, like, like total diva Odell, that kind of thing. But anyway, all right, uh, three more. J-Man raps, my boy Gino is going to lead the Hawks to the Super Bowl. Bradley Jets gave up on him too early. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, Radiclib, 3-0 and plus a Giants upset win and a two-game lead on Bradley, including head-to-head, a head-to-head shellacking. Emma, you, must be peak- you might be peaking too soon. Usually week one is not good for me because I don't have a feel for these teams yet. But this was a decent, it, it was a perfect week for me. Um and the final I am of the ESVN episode two. Let Russ Russ choke. After last night, there's no wonder why Lamar Jackson thinks he deserves more than Russell Wilson. He does. Damn straight. Good way to end this. Come on, Russ. I mean, I wish that Lamar took that money, though. I want him to just at least get his money. Ugh. I appreciate the betting on himself, but there's Me just too. so little opportunities for so much guaranteed money that I, I'm completely with you there. All right, guys, that is the end of the show. We will see you on Thursday for our picks. And then, like, we'll be numbering these as full episodes. ESVN 3 will be next week for the week after that. But we have little just, like, bonus stuff for our picks Thursday at 4 p.m. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.